I'd like to welcome you to the third session of our series on the Crusades, as seen from Western, Greek and Arabic sources. And let us begin this particular session with the main picture around which I arranged last week's discussion. This is a 19th century representation of the taking of Jerusalem by the Crusaders on the 15th of July, 1099. We should set aside the fact that the taking of Jerusalem was attended by a vast massacre, and we should look at the main point for the moment, which is that Jerusalem has been taken a miscellaneous group of Westerners, mostly French, with some English and some Germans and some Italians, has turned up in Constantinople and has then marched south, smashing the Turks at Dorylion, taking Nicaea, carrying on to Antioch, a very well-fortified city, and taking that and holding it and beating a much larger Turkish army of relief sent against them, they've then marched south. They've taken many of the smaller towns around Jerusalem, Bethlehem, for example, and in July 1099, they've got through the walls of Jerusalem. Again, a very well-fortified city, and they've taken it. And at this point, you might say, mission accomplished. The First Crusade has succeeded in its first mission, or it has succeeded in its entire mission, which is to take Jerusalem, which is to take the holy places from the Islamic powers. It doesn't end there. The story does not at all end with that great burst of religious exaltation that attended the taking of Jerusalem in July 1099, it doesn't end there for a number of reasons. The first is that the Islamic powers are not happy with the loss of Jerusalem. They regard this as, at the least, an affront. So, in early August 1099, an Islamic relief force of 20,000 men is sent up from Egypt. They have, until very recently, well they have until the Crusaders took it away, had possession of Jerusalem. They've now lost it. They regard the Crusades, remember what I said last week, I said this twice, because the Western Crusaders were such an unexpected intrusion into the politics and the military affairs of the Near East, these Western Crusaders were at first seen as nothing more than a particularly effective group of Byzantine mercenaries. They noticed that they had turned up in Constantinople. They noticed that Alexius had given them physical and moral support. They did not necessarily pay attention to the falling out between the Empire and the Crusaders after the taking of Antioch. They regarded the Crusaders as Byzantine mercenaries, and they thought that it would be a fairly simple matter to drive them out from Jerusalem, and then to strike a deal with Alexius, which would restore something like the old status quo, the old idea that Jerusalem and the holy places are within the realms of Islam, but that the empire itself should have its own traditional borders respected. And that is probably what was behind the dispatch of this relief force of 20,000 Egyptians. However, on the 10th of August 1099, Godfrey of Bouillon, a man whom I will say more about in a moment, was sent out to meet this relief force with an army of 10,000. Of course, this is an army in very high enthusiasm because it has already taken Jerusalem and it now has possession of the True Cross. The True Cross was dug up by Helena, the mother of the Emperor Constantine in the 320s, when she led an archaeological expedition to Jerusalem, and she uncovered 
what she claimed was the cross, the true cross, the piece of wood on which Christ had been crucified. And ever since, this has been kept in the main church in Jerusalem, and the Crusaders now had possession of it, carrying this relic of the utmost holiness. They marched out, accompanied by the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, and on the 12th of August 1099, Godfrey launched a surprised attack outside Ascalon. And if you look at this map, you can see Jerusalem as the big black dot in the middle, and Ascalon is there on the coast. It's not even marked by a dot, mm. but it is a very important strategic town. If you control Ascalon, you have secured the main approach from Egypt, and Egypt is the main Islamic power in the region at this moment. In August, Godfrey launches a surprise attack outside Ascalon. Once again, the Crusaders score a complete and overwhelming victory. There were apparently 13,000 Islamic dead, a vast booty because the Egyptian camp was loaded with gold and silver and jewels and precious things of all kind. The Fatimid vizier, the chief minister of the caliph, got back onto his ship and sailed back to Alexandria with the bad news of the defeat. And this, for the moment, not permanently, but this for the moment is the end of any threat of a counterattack that might take back Jerusalem from the Crusaders. Here again is a 19th century painting by Jean-Victor Schnetz. Again, this is at Versailles. King Louis-Philippe in the 1840s wanted to commemorate the great deeds of France in the past, so he commissioned a series of historical paintings that would be set up in Versailles, and this picture of the Battle of Ascalon is one of them. Here you have the Crusaders, they're drinking water, they are about to take their ease, there is still some continuing fighting, but the battle has been won. The Battle of Ascalon is of great importance, as I said, because for the moment, not permanently, nothing in the Crusades is permanent, but for the moment, they have checked any prospect of an Islamic counterattack that will dislodge them from Jerusalem. But then the further question arises, which is what next? What are the Crusaders to do with their success? When Urban II had preached his crusade, he had given no indication of what was to be done with the holy places after they had been conquered. Remember I said last week that a natural assumption would be that since Alexius, the Byzantine emperor, was the greatest Christian power in the region, the holy places should be restored after 400 years of alienation to the Byzantine Empire. And Alexius should, assisted of course by the Pope, become the protector of these holy places. Two problems with this. The first is that no Byzantine emperor after about 650 showed any interest whatsoever in the wholesale reconquest of Syria. This had been taken by the Arabs in the 630s, and after that it was solidly and incontestably Islamic territory. That is not to say that Muslims were, at any time in this period, the majority population in these territories, but they were the dominant power. And the Byzantines were not interested in a restoration of Syria. After about 700, maybe after 600, the Byzantine Empire reconfigured itself, no longer a great multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-language Roman Empire that 
enclosed all the shores of the Mediterranean, the Byzantine Empire increasingly became a Greek Orthodox nation-state, and the presence within the empire of substantial numbers of non-Greeks and non-Orthodox Christians was a problem. It would be a problem. It might be unavoidable in some instances where you have a difficult border and it is strategically necessary to incorporate a certain number of Armenians or even of Arabs into the territory. But if it could be avoided, the incorporation of non-Greeks and non-Orthodox Christians was something that should be avoided. And Alexius had no interest whatever in taking over Syria. It would be hard to defend. It would be a permanent difficulty with the Islamic powers with which he hoped to continue enjoying good relations. It would be more trouble than it was worth. How do you incorporate these people into the empire? Even if they are not Arabic-speaking Muslims, they're not Orthodox Greek-speaking Christians, they're various kinds of Monophysite heretic, Syriac speakers. They're not seen as any kind of addition to the empire's strength. So Alexius had no interest in itself in taking over the holy places. There is the further difficulty that, remember how Alexius was hurrying south with a relief army because he'd heard that the Crusaders needed support there. Unfortunately, Alexius is met by some of the Crusaders who've decided that the battle is worthless, the battle is lost, and persuaded by them, Alexius turns back and does not deliver the expected support. Then, when the Crusaders do take and keep Antioch, they decide, or at least one of them decides, that this will not be handed back to Alexius as per the agreement made in Constantinople. It will instead become an independent territory ruled by one of the Crusaders, namely Bohemond. Alexius regards Antioch as an important strategic support for the southern territories of the empire. So he wants it back, the Crusaders won't hand it back. And for that reason, any kind of agreement with Alexius after the taking of Jerusalem is at least temporarily off the table. Alexius doesn't want the holy places. The Crusaders are in no position, and they're also in no mood to offer these to Alexius. So what are they going to do? Many of the Crusaders don't bother asking that question. It seems that the majority of the Crusader soldiers returned to Europe very soon after the fall of Jerusalem, or at least after the Battle of Ascalon. What can be done? Are the Crusaders simply to say, there, we've beaten you, now you be better to us next time. All of them get back into their ships and go home and leave the Holy Land in the possession of one of the Islamic powers, which will then be sufficiently cautious not to make trouble in future. Or are they going to stay there, even very small numbers of them? And did I say that most of the Crusaders appear to have gone home after the Battle of Ascalon? There is one claim that there were only 300 armed knights in Jerusalem a few months after the Battle of Ascalon. Now, 300 armed knights does not mean there were only 300 Crusaders, because there would be retainers, there would be camp followers, there'd be all sorts of associated groups of people with that. But I think we can take that 300 armed knights as a rough indication of the fact that the great army that had set out from Constantinople was now a shadow of itself, because the war had been won. So what is to happen? The first thing that the Crusaders do is they decide that they themselves will rule Jerusalem and its surrounding territories. And so for this end, 
they offer the crown, they offer the title King of Jerusalem to Raymond of Toulouse. He is the oldest, he is the richest, he is the most experienced of the crusade leaders. He is somebody who has been of critical importance at every step on the journey from Constantinople to Jerusalem. He is the obvious candidate to be the King of Jerusalem. Raymond, however, refuses the title. Why he refuses the title is something that nobody understood at the time and nobody understands now. The most likely explanation is that he was rather hoping that the first time he was offered the crown, he could refuse it with a great show of modesty and then it would be pressed on him and he would then be able to exact all manner of conditions. Oh, I'll take on this crown, but I want to have this status, and I want people to accept me as this and that and the other. He thought that by refusing the crown on the first offering, he would strengthen his position for when it was offered again, and this time he would accept However, the Crusaders do not seem to have thought they had enough time for bargaining with Raymond over the conditions on which he would become King of Jerusalem. And so, on his first refusal, the crown was offered to Godfrey of Wion, a picture of whom, which probably doesn't look like him, is on the right of this slide. Godfrey refused to accept the title King of Jerusalem on the grounds that there was only one King of Jerusalem and that, of course, was Christ. But what he does is he accepts the title of Advocatus Sancti Sepulchri. Godfrey refused the crown as King of Jerusalem, saying that Christ was the only King of Jerusalem Instead, he took on the Latin title Advocatus Sancti Sepulchri, or Protector of the Holy Sepulchre. He may also have used the rather more ambiguous term of princeps, which in Latin means everything from a tribal chieftain up to and including Roman Emperor. A nice ambiguous title, which could mean whatever its user wanted it to mean at the time of saying. Godfrey therefore becomes the ruler of Jerusalem. He justifies his title by the fact that he was the man who led the successful charge at the Battle of Ascalon. But as I said, he is the ruler of Jerusalem with whatever status you care to discuss. And everyone regards the Crusader armies in the Holy Land as the greatest power in the Near East. But of course, most of these armies have gone home. There may have been only 300 armed knights, plus others, in Jerusalem itself. So Godfrey has a kingdom, but he has no means of defending it, let alone extending it. And so the whole operation is still rather provisional. There is no thought for the long term. Godfrey did extend the control of Jerusalem over the surrounding territories. He took a number of other territories, he took a number of the coastal cities, but in 1100 he died. He died of one of the epidemic diseases that always raged through the Holy Land. I'll talk more about the medical conditions in the Crusader States maybe the week after next. Something I didn't say was that Admar, the papal legate, the man who led the charge at Doriliam and who led his soldiers into battle outside Antioch holding the Holy Lance, died after the taking of Antioch of cholera, I believe. Epidemic disease was a continual scourge of the Western Crusaders. It was a continual scourge of everybody. Saladin himself died in one of the epidemics. The Near East was not a particularly healthy place at this time. But in 1100, 
at a comparatively young age, he may only have been in his 30s, Godfrey died suddenly. That brought the question back, what are we going to do? We have conquered Jerusalem, but how do we keep it, and on what terms? The first answer was offered by the new papal legate, a man called Deimbert, who was now the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem. His idea was that Jerusalem should now be set up as a protectorate of the Pope, with the Latin patriarch as the Pope's viceroy in Jerusalem. And that would have solved a number of problems. One of them would have been that the Pope was directly responsible for the protection of Jerusalem, and the Pope would have used his spiritual and diplomatic power in the West to ensure adequate support from the Western powers for this new kingdom or this new territory of Jerusalem. However, Godfrey's associates, let's call them Godfrey's friends, decide that Jerusalem should not become a papal protectorate or any kind of theocracy. Instead, they immediately called Godfrey's brother over, Baldwin. He gained sufficient support among the armed men remaining in Jerusalem and was crowned King of Jerusalem on Christmas Day 1100, and the papal legate Deimbert was forced to crown him as King of Jerusalem. Mind you, that's one story. The other story I've read is that Deimbert refused to crown Baldwin King of Jerusalem in Jerusalem, and the coronation had to take place in Bethlehem. But whatever the case, there is now a King of Jerusalem, not a protector of the holy places, no ambiguous titles, a regular king of Jerusalem, a king in the West European sense. The foundation of the kingdom of Jerusalem really should be dated to Christmas Day 1100, when Baldwin became Baldwin I, king of Jerusalem. What we can say about Baldwin is that he was a notably brilliant politician and general, and he is the man who created the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Let me show you a map of the Crusader states as they were around 1135. I keep on saying that these are provisional borders, they're always shifting, but you can take these as roughly the average size of what is called the First Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Kingdom of Jerusalem as it was between Christmas Day 1100 and the loss of Jerusalem in 1187. It covers much the same territory as the modern state of Israel, plus the south of Lebanon. And if you have any knowledge of the geopolitics of Israel, you will know that Israel although defended by state-of-the-art weaponry and on the quiet, I think, with nuclear weapons, is not a strategically secure territory because it has no strategic depth. When, for example, the Germans invaded Russia in 1941, the German armies overran well over a million square miles of Soviet territory that didn't let them win because the Russians, or in those days the Soviets, had immense strategic depth. They could withdraw everything that was movable far beyond the German lines, far to the east, and they could carry on fighting. And they had adequate supply lines from Britain and America, whereas Israel does not have that luxury it's not very much bigger than an English county. It's the same with the Kingdom of Jerusalem. It never had completely secure borders, mostly lines in the desert, sometimes reinforced by lines of castles, but it was always the case that the loss of one big battle might overturn the entire kingdom. But, so far as the Kingdom of Jerusalem was established, 
and so far as it was maintained, that is a consequence of Baldwin I. He is the man who created and who in its first few decades sustained the kingdom of Jerusalem. What Baldwin did was to expand the kingdom. It started out as effective control over Jerusalem and a few of the surrounding towns. Baldwin set about consolidating his kingdom. He took most of the coastal cities, and the most important of these is Accra, but he also took Jaffa. He took a number of the coastal ports on the eastern Mediterranean shore. He also made sure to take Ascalon, which did as much as could be done to secure his kingdom from attack from the southwest from Egypt. Baldwin is the man who created the constitution of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and that's something I'll talk about at some length next week. He encouraged the emigration of reasonable numbers of people from the West, mostly from France. Baldwin himself spoke French as his native language, and the working language in the New Kingdom of Jerusalem was Norman French, though the official language of the state, of course, was Latin. But the working language, the language that you would most often hear on the streets of Jerusalem and the other great cities, was French, or the main language that you'd hear from the Western settlers in the kingdom was French. It was overwhelmingly a French creation, which is why King Louis-Philippe in the 1840s put the Crusades down as one of the great achievements of French arms. Baldwin fought a number of important battles with the Egyptians and with the Islamic powers to the east, the Emirate of Damascus. He won those battles and was thereby able to expand and, so far as possible, to consolidate the borders of his new kingdom. He also began the process of rapprochement with the Byzantine Empire. There really was nothing that Alexius could do to grab back Antioch. That was held by Bohemond. Baldwin supported Bohemond in some degree. Baldwin did not really want a powerful Byzantine empire as his own direct or semi-direct neighbour, but short of that, he was prepared to enter into a diplomatic exchange with the Byzantine empire and to normalise relations, something that he also did with the surrounding Islamic powers. One of the great advantages the Crusader states had during their first half century of existence was that the neighbouring Islamic powers were fragmented. There was no overlord, there was no agreed caliph with control over all of the Near East. And so it was possible for the King of Jerusalem to pick and choose among his Islamic neighbours, now supporting one against the others, now supporting another against the others. This gave the kingdom time to consolidate, time to put down such roots as it ever did put down. The surrounding Islamic powers, the rulers of those powers, might well have been willing to agree, oh yes, the Western Latins are terrible people, they're infidels, they must be driven out of the Near East, they must be deprived of Jerusalem, and the whole of the Near East, as it was in about 1050, should return to Islamic rule. Everyone was willing to agree that in principle, but in practice it was just so very convenient to strike deals with Baldwin, because Baldwin was in charge of a powerful and compact army which was capable of lending 
very useful support to the surrounding emirs in their wars against each other. And by doing this, Baldwin was able to expand his borders and to buy time for those borders to be reinforced and to become an established fact in the politics and the diplomacy of the Near East. One of Baldwin's most important acts of consolidation was in his marriages. When he first turned up and was crowned king of Jerusalem, he had an Armenian wife. Her existence and her support were both very useful for gaining political support among the Armenian population in places like Edessa, and it was also useful for outreach to the non-Catholic, non-French or Greek-speaking Christians in the Kingdom of Jerusalem. However, the moment Baldwin no longer needed the support of these people in Jerusalem, he put aside his wife. He then married a Sicilian woman, Adelaide del Vasto, she was the regent of Sicily. He married her, I think, in 1113. She outlived her usefulness, and in 1117, he procured a divorce from her as well. This led to a dispute, because Adelaide's son from her first marriage was Roger II of Sicily, a powerful ruler in the western Mediterranean, and he was... First of all, rather pleased that his mother had made such an advantageous marriage to the king of Jerusalem. He was then mortified when the king of Jerusalem divorced her and sent her back to Sicily. And so for the rest of Roger's reign, which was quite long, he refused all naval support to the kingdom of Jerusalem. And his naval support on many occasions would have been highly valuable. This being said, Baldwin's rather casual approach to marriage, which he seems to have regarded as an appendage to his diplomatic activities, did bring a great deal of advantage to the kingdom. Baldwin died without heirs, though he was married several times, he didn't have a son. Baldwin died without heirs in 1118, and there was an immediate question over who should succeed. However, during his 18 years as King of Jerusalem, Baldwin had established the Kingdom of Jerusalem as a solid fact in the region. Although there was some doubt who would be the next King of Jerusalem, there was no doubt at all that there should be a next King of Jerusalem, and there was also no serious doubt as to what the Kingdom of Jerusalem meant. Other of Baldwin's successes was to bring the Venetians into a solid alliance. And the Republic of Venice was one of the great naval powers of the age. It was certainly the greatest commercial power of the age. And there began a long and on the whole fruitful alliance between the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the Republic of Venice. The deal was that the Venetians would supply such naval support as might from time to time be required to take or to defend the coastal cities of the kingdom. In return for that, the Venetians would receive commercial and other privileges in the coastal cities where they settled. One of the privileges the Venetians and later on the other Italian merchant states enjoyed was a sort of extraterritorial jurisdiction. It meant that there was a quarter set aside in all of the coastal cities. This was settled by Venetian traders and the Republic of Venice enjoyed a degree of sovereignty over its own citizens in their own quarters. The value of these coastal cities to the Republic of Venice, well, I think that's fairly obvious. The eastern shores of the Mediterranean, in what is now Israel and Lebanon, are the obvious 
terminus points for the trade routes that stretch all the way to China and India. Spice, silk, all sorts of luxury goods would arrive in the coastal cities now controlled by the Kingdom of Jerusalem. They would then be shipped further west by the Venetians. The Kingdom of Jerusalem would gain a great deal of revenue from the transit of these goods and the Republic of Venice had solid and secure commercial bases on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean. So a long and fruitful relationship only terminated by the final destruction of the Crusader states in the late 13th century. And again, I'll come on to that in due course. Oh, there is a picture of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This is a church that was built at various periods. Its earliest parts are Roman, however, at various times since the establishment of Christianity in the Roman Empire, the Holy Sepulchre had suffered destruction by enemy action or by fire, and it had been frequently rebuilt, and it has been frequently renovated and rebuilt ever since. But the bell tower in the centre of this picture, that was built during or shortly after the reign of Baldwin I. So the Crusaders did not build the Holy Sepulchral Church as we see it now, but the Crusaders made substantial additions to it, and many of these still survive. There are the trading routes, and you can see that they all centre on Venice and Genoa. They travel all over the Mediterranean, all through the Black Sea, and remember the Venetians have a substantial presence in Constantinople itself. Their trading presence in the Kingdom of Jerusalem was an important part of their commercial activities. Something else that we need to remember is the very great number of pilgrims who came from the West to Jerusalem and Bethlehem and to the other holy places. Pilgrims are rather like modern tourists. Each individual pilgrim might not come with very much money, but when you're dealing with tens or even hundreds of thousands of people every year, the revenue brought in by these pilgrims is a valuable source of revenue to both private persons in the Kingdom of Jerusalem and to the state of Jerusalem itself. We also have a slow and never very large, but in the context of the day, a substantial trickle of fresh military reinforcements from the West. It is these military reinforcements which allowed Baldwin to consolidate the kingdom. What I've said so far is that after the taking of Jerusalem, nobody had the slightest idea of what was to happen next. The Kingdom of Jerusalem emerged by accident. Nobody could think of anything else to do with it, and so the Kingdom of Jerusalem was established with Godfrey as its first ruler. When Godfrey died, his brother Baldwin was brought in to replace him, and it is Baldwin, his personal ambitions to be a great king, who ensured that the Kingdom of Jerusalem should become a solid part of the diplomacy and the general politics of the Near East. If we go back to the map, we can see that although the Kingdom of Jerusalem is the largest and the most important one of the Crusader states, most important for the obvious reason that its capital is Jerusalem itself, there are other Crusader states or other Crusader kingdoms. There's the County of Tripoli, the Principality of Antioch, the County of Edessa, and there are smaller places. These are formally independent, but they're smaller, they're poorer, they're weaker than the Kingdom of Jerusalem. They very rapidly become effectively satellites of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. 
The only exception would be the Principality of Antioch, the rulers of which had their own particular ambitions. And here I come to the ruler of Antioch. Remember Bohemond. I mentioned him several times last week. He was a Norman born in Italy. He was the son of Robert Guiscard, or Robert the Fox, a Norman ruler of Calabria in southern Italy. He had given much trouble to Alexius I in the 1180s when he invaded the Balkan provinces of the Byzantine Empire. The Normans had established themselves in southern Italy partly by accident. It's because a group of Norman pilgrims were passing through some of the Italian ports. There was an Arabic raid from across the Mediterranean from North Africa. The Normans thought the idea of paying these people off, bribing them to go away, was rather scandalous. So they put off their pilgrim robes, took up the sword and defeated the Arabic pirates after which they decided that southern Italy was a rather jolly place to settle, and so they stayed, and more Normans came in, until eventually the Normans conquered the whole of southern Italy, and then the whole of Sicily, and established a number of Norman kingdoms and duchies. They then thought it would be a fine idea to expand their rule across the Adriatic into the Balkan provinces of the Byzantine Empire. They found that this was not possible because Alexius went into a close naval alliance with the Venetians who had control of the Adriatic and the Normans were thrown out of the Balkan provinces but they continued to rule southern Italy. Bohemond wanted his own kingdom. Although he was the elder son, Sicily, his father's main possession, went to a younger son by a later marriage. This meant that Bohemond had to settle in Tarento in southern Italy, which he always regarded as a territory far too small for a man of his undoubted talents and his no less undoubted ambition. Bohemond joined the Crusades when he saw them marching through Amalfi. Whether he was struck by a fit of religious devotion on seeing this Crusader army or whether he thought, hmm, there's an interesting opportunity for a man of my sort, those are questions which we're not able to settle. He turned up in Constantinople in 1099 with the other Crusaders. Alexius knew all about him because Alexius had been dealing with Bohemond for pushing on 15 years. But everyone was very friendly in Constantinople in the late 1090s and relations between Alexius and Bohemond were rather stiff but rather friendly. Bohemond led part of the Crusader army through Asia Minor and he was the critical man in the capture and the retention of Antioch. And remember, this is the critical moment in the first part of the First Crusade. The capture of Jerusalem was the moment of central importance, but a moment of second importance was the taking of Antioch. Until the fall of Antioch, Alexius and the Crusader leaders were on excellent terms. After that, however, Bohemond announced that the emperor had not made good on the promises he'd made in Constantinople. He had not supplied the Crusaders with the support that he'd promised, and as such, any deal made in Constantinople was now off the table, and since Bohemond had been of critical importance in the taking and the retention of Antioch, why? Antioch belonged to him. He was the ruler of Antioch. Bohemond established himself as the ruler of Antioch. He was the prince of Antioch. And that is what he wanted to remain for the time being. 
Anna Comnena gives an interesting portrait of Bohemond. He has an important place in her own long history of her times. She says of him, By his nostrils nature had given free passage for the high spirit which bubbled up from his heart. A certain charm hung about this man, but was partly marred by a general air of the horrible, which seems to be a fairly just description of Bohemond. In 1099, he wouldn't give Antioch back to the emperor. But his own ambitions didn't stop with the taking and the holding of Antioch. It is a substantial territory. It is compact. It's reasonably easy to defend. And Antioch, remember, is a very well-fortified city that cannot easily be taken. But Bohemond wanted more. He did not want to stay only as Prince of Antioch. He wanted to be much, much more. Sometimes he fancied himself as the Byzantine Emperor. Sometimes he fancied himself as something else. But he wanted to be greater still than the Prince of Antioch. A stroke of bad luck in 1100... While campaigning against the Turks, he was taken prisoner by them, and he was held prisoner for three years while negotiations for his ransom dragged on. During his time in captivity, Antioch was ruled by his nephew Tancred, who was remarkably loyal to his uncle, surprising bearing in mind the family. When Bohemond was finally released, Bohemond took over again in Antioch. But in the meantime, Tancred continued to be an irritant to the emperor. Alexius began to apply pressure to Antioch. At the beginning of his reign, let me find the maps again. There is the empire at the beginning of the reign of Alexius. You'll see that the Turks have taken virtually all of the Asian provinces... The empire itself is confined to a small strip of territory fronting the coast. That is the empire as it was in 1099. Because of the great success of the Crusades, Alexius and his immediate successors were able to restore Byzantine control over most of the territories of the empire. And so by the later years of Alexius, the empire was now an undoubted great power in the Near East again, bordered onto the Principality of Antioch, and was always able to apply pressure to whoever happened to be ruling in Antioch. It is because of that that in 1104... Bohemond decided that the only way to maintain his position, let alone to extend it, was to go personally into Western Europe to raise men and money. However, Bohemond was blocked from leaving Antioch because the empire and its Venetian allies controlled all of the sea approaches. Bohemond couldn't travel to Western Europe overland because it meant passing through the empire. It meant passing under the walls of Constantinople and Alexius would certainly have been waiting for that because the Byzantine emperors always could rely on an excellent intelligence service. And so it was necessary for Bohemond to travel to the West by sea. But again, the empire and its Venetian allies had a close control over all the sea routes in the eastern Mediterranean. Therefore, Bohemond needed to get to the west, but he couldn't get to the west by a very easy route. And here is the solution that he came up with. It's given in Book 11 of Anna Comnena's Alexiad. He devised a plan which was exceedingly sordid and yet exceedingly ingenious, First of all, he left the town of Antioch to his nephew Tancred and had a report spread about himself which said that Bohemond had died. 
and while still alive, he arranged that the world should think of him as dead. And when he found that the report had taken good hold, a wooden coffin was soon prepared, and a ship in which the coffin was placed, and also he, the living corpse. And they sailed away from Sude, which is the harbour of Antioch, to Rome. Thus Bohemond was carried across the sea as a corpse, for to all appearance he was a corpse to judge by the coffin and the demeanour of his companions, for wherever they stopped the barbarians plucked out their hair and mourned him ostentatiously, and inside the coffin he was lying stretched out dead for the time being, but for the rest inhaling and exhaling air through unseen holes in the coffin. And to make the corpse appear stale and odiferous, they strangled or killed a cock and placed it with the corpse. And when a cock has been dead for four or five days, its smell is most disagreeable for those who have a sense of smell. And from this I have learned that the whole barbarian nation is hard to turn back from any undertaking upon which they have started, and there is nothing too burdensome for them to bear when they have once embarked upon difficult tasks of their own choice. The device of the barbarian was unique in the world of our time and was directed towards the downfall of the Roman hegemony. Never before this time did any barbarian or Greek devise such a plan against his enemies, nor do I fancy will another such ever be seen in our lifetime. When he reached Corfu, he arose from the dead and left the corpse bearing coffin there and basked in more sunlight, and breathed purer air, and wandered about the town of Corfu. From that you can gather that Bohemond was a man of immense resourcefulness. He couldn't get across the Mediterranean in any normal way, so he pretended to be dead, and he was carried across the sea in a coffin with breathing holes drilled in it, and to convince any of the Venetian or imperial captains who might have intercepted the ship, he made sure to have a dead chicken put in the coffin with him. That meant that anyone said, oh, that's Bohemond, is it? We'll get that coffin open, I want to see him. There was a whiff of rotting flesh, and it was, oh, actually, no, just leave it closed. And by that, Bohemond got clean away from Antioch, to Rome, and from there he went to Western Europe, where he had a mixed reception. Henry I refused him entry. He was stopped to the Channel ports, not allowed across the Channel. But Philip I of France, a much more credulous man, took him in, and didn't just take him in, but gave him his daughter Constance in marriage. To be married to the King of France's daughter is a great step up in the pecking order in Western Europe. It surely meant that Bohemond would now be able to raise the large numbers of men that he needed for whatever project he really had in mind. There is a representation of the marriage of Bohemond and his wife Constance. It appears to have been a very happy marriage for as long as it lasted. But the main purpose was to get men and money out of the King of France, and Bohemond got both. He got a large army and a large amount of money. He arrives in Italy with an army of apparently 34,000 men, he had been given these by the King of France as a kind of wedding dowry for the purpose of defending Antioch. Defending Antioch from the Empire, defending it from the Islamic powers. However, Bohemond's ambition was not simply to be Prince of Antioch. It does seem that he wanted to be the Byzantine Emperor. He saw a weakness in Constantinople, he saw the possibility for a successful overthrow of Alexius and for a new dynasty to be established there. So his first act on reaching Italy was not to continue 
across the eastern Mediterranean to Antioch, but to sail straight across the Adriatic and once more, just as his father had 30 years earlier, to invade the Balkan provinces of the empire. Alexius was no fool. Alexius was waiting for him. Bohemond laid siege to the, the coastal Balkan port of Dyrrhachium, but Alexius then blockaded him and kept him under very close blockade until he was out of food and water and forced to negotiate. And Alexius knew exactly that he couldn't really trust Bohemond, and so the only agreement for which Alexis would settle was that Bohemond should swear public fealty to Alexius. He had been given the title of Sebastos. He would be allowed to continue ruling Antioch when he was permitted to go about his way, but he had in public promised very solemnly that from now on he would be a vassal of Alexius. There was no real way even for Bohemond out of that public display of abasement, so Bohemond's answer was not to go back to Antioch. He left it in his nephew's hands, he left it with Tancred, and he died in 1111 in Canossa, and there on the right is a photograph of his mausoleum. It's rather a nice place. I've never managed to get there myself, but it's certainly on my list of things to see when I do get to southern Italy. So that is the end of Bohemond, one of the stars in any history of the First Crusade and the decade or so following that. But although Bohemond is ultimately a failure, there is no doubt that the Crusader kingdoms are a solid and established fact in the Near East. They appear to be unshakable in the short term. I've spoken so far about the effect of the First Crusade on the Near East, and that is the most obvious effect. However, it coincides with an enormous outburst of joy and enthusiasm in the West. Ever since the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century, Western Europe had been a place that had had things done to it by outsiders. In the first instance, it was invaded by the northern barbarians. But then the northern barbarians settled down, they became more civilised, they converted to Roman Catholicism, and almost immediately they were beset by other outsiders, by much more savage northern barbarians, by various attempts at an Islamic conquest, the Arabs streaming across the Pyrenees or sailing across from North Africa, to establish pirate bases on the coasts of France and Italy, or the Byzantine government meddled ruthlessly in the politics of the West European successor states to the Western Roman Empire. For centuries the West had been beleaguered, and now suddenly the new feudal kingdoms of Western Europe, chiefly France but also England and Germany, had reached out far beyond their normal orbit. They had reached out deep into the Near East and they had beaten every army sent against them and they had conquered Jerusalem. They had conquered the centre of the world and they were holding it. And this coincides, and to some extent it caused, a great outburst of confidence and enthusiasm in Western Europe. Here is an effigy of a knight in All Saints Parish Church in Goxhill in Lincolnshire. And if you go around the older churches in my own county Kent, you'll see these everywhere. Crusader Knights. He's a man who took up the cross, he went out, he fought in the successful captures of Antioch and Jerusalem. 
He then came back to the land of his birth and died and was buried. And in his church where he was buried forever after, he would rest in effigy in full crusader armour, holding his sword in his right hand. You see this in the literature, in the music, in the art of Western Europe. The triumph of the crusade was something that was not quickly forgotten. Indeed, it was never forgotten. It was commemorated in a whole series of great historical accounts, the Gesta Francorum, the history of Fulcra, Chartres, etc. Stories of the First Crusade were spread in the more literary histories and also in popular ballads and in various popular legends. So the First Crusade has been an outstanding success, at least for those people who didn't die in the fighting or weren't massacred in the aftermath. And the Crusader kingdoms are established and everyone expects those Crusader kingdoms to last for a very long time. The West European peoples expected the Crusader kingdoms to last at least until the Second Coming of Christ. For the Islamic powers in the Near East, the Crusader kingdoms would remain until such time as those Islamic powers could pull themselves together and coordinate a counterattack. But in the first half of the 12th century, it didn't look as if that was particularly likely. Largely thanks to Baldwin, the first king of Jerusalem, and partly thanks to Bohemond, the prince of Antioch, the Crusader states are established and consolidated. And for the foreseeable future, Jerusalem and its surrounds will be a territory ruled by French-speaking kings and nobles, and there will be places where you hear any number of West European languages, but namely French, spoken in the streets. So that's all I have to say about the consolidation of these kingdoms. Now, are there any questions arising? 